Now we're going to talk about uh, side channel attacks. So this is uh, something related to when we implement uh, cryptographic systems in hardware and software, uh, because that can create a few problems. It's also related to, to other security protocols where you also can get uh, side channel attacks. Now, uh, we're going to uh, start with an introduction uh, and introduce the concept of side channel attacks. And then we are going to uh, talk about uh, two different types of attacks. So timing attacks and emission attacks. So a side channel is simply an unintended channel emitting information. And this is, in the case of cryptography, due to physical implementation flaws and not theoretical weaknesses or uh, forcing attempts. So uh, there are various categories, so timing attacks, acoustic attacks, electromagnetic attacks, uh, or in general emission attacks. And uh, we're going to uh, look at uh, timing attacks now. So consider uh, how we're doing arithmetics. Uh, so using the standard algorithms for addition and multiplication, and in our example, we will use the binary system uh, because this nicely illustrates uh, how it is for uh, computing systems. Now, uh, give any number to an algorithm A, and A will multiply your number by a secret value X, okay? Now, can you tell the difference between X is equal to three or X is equal to seven? So this example is sort of uh, an algorithm that wants to, to encrypt uh, any value you give, give it with a secret, uh, secret cryptographic key. And now the question is, uh, if we can tell the, tell the difference uh, due to timing. So obviously if it's a simple multiplication and we know what we entered, we can solve the equation and compute X, but uh, we are interested in computing it, uh, seeing if we can learn it, uh, to can tell a difference between uh, different values of X here. Now, uh, assume that we give the number 25 as our challenge to this algorithm A. Uh, looking at the numbers, uh, we can see that uh, three in uh, binary is one, one, and seven in binary is uh, one, one, one. And 25 uh, in binary is uh, one, one, zero, zero, one. Uh, let's assume that each step in this algorithm takes one time unit, then if we use the standard uh, multiplication algorithm that we had learned uh, a long, long time ago in school, then uh, 11001 uh, times 11 will take 17 time units. And this is due to, we have five units for multiplying uh, this one with uh, each of these values. And then we have another five uh, for multiplying this one with uh, each of the five time units. Uh, so this is uh, 10 time units. And then uh, we have uh, one additional time unit for shifting uh, the second result one step, because remember when you multiply uh, multiple digit numbers, you don't put them under each other directly, you have to shift them one step. So that's one time unit. And finally, we get uh, six time units for adding these numbers together. So that adds up to 17 time units. And now obviously, uh, since uh, seven was one, 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 uh, this will take slightly longer. And it actually takes 24 time units. Uh, to do uh, in the same uh, same way as we, we counted for, for the first one. So yes, we can indeed see a difference between x equals three and x equals seven when uh, we do this operation. So we can use uh, timing here to infer what uh, the x is. 
And this is just an illustratory example uh, to show the, the concept of timing attacks. Obviously, uh, the cryptographic operations are uh, much more complex and a lot of them actually uh, combined. Uh, so then we, we cannot use algebra to, to figure out uh, what the key is. Uh, but uh, timing attacks uh, can indeed uh, help us there. Now, uh, as I said, the first multiplication took 17 time units to perform and the second took uh, 24 time units. So this is one example of why constant time operations are desirable because uh, then each operation, then if we had constant time operations, then both of these operations would take uh, the same number of uh, units. So we don't have this optimization. So we say that we, in, in the case of, uh, in the case of uh, one, one, then we add a zero in front and we continue to do the operations uh, on those zeros, although it's totally unnecessary, then we would get 24 uh, time units for that one as well. Uh, so that would be constant time operations. Uh, now, uh, as an exercise, uh, consider uh, the uh, numbers uh, x equals to 2, uh, that is 1, 0 in binary, and x equals 3, that is uh, 1, 1 in binary. Uh, take a few moments and see if uh, we can tell the difference uh, between these two numbers and uh, in which cases we can and we, in which cases we cannot. Now, uh, the next uh, example on timing attacks is uh, an attack uh, against uh, SSH, so it's a the secure shell protocol. This was an attack back in 2001, and um, this is for logging in remotely to servers. So it's a text-based uh, protocol. So you you get a text-based terminal on the server, and uh, each uh, keystroke that you make is sent. Uh, to the to the server, and the the server executes uh, the program and handles input. So basically, you're just sending your input uh, to the server as you you create it. And uh, in this case, they actually used uh, this uh, this fact as a side channel. So since each keystroke in the password when you are logging in, the first thing you do in the session is sent in a separate package. So, so each keystroke is sent uh, as you type it. Then the attacker can actually observe the network traffic and uh, the delay between the packets on the network will correspond to the delays between uh, how you type the, the keys. And they found that uh, they could use this uh, timing attack, uh, so measure the timing between the keystrokes to uh, improve password guessing by a factor of 50. Uh, so that's quite a lot uh, of advantage. Uh, so make, making the, the password much easier to guess. And uh, as a side note, yeah, analytics scripts on many websites, uh, they also send key presses and each thing you do to the server as you type. And uh, for instance, when you, when you search in Google uh, and they present these results as you type, they have to send each keystroke uh, as you type it. So these are exactly the same situations. And it has actually been found that some of these analytics scripts, yes, they are active uh, on the uh, password prompt, which means that they send all these uh, packets. Uh, so every keystroke you make, when you're writing your username and your password, 
uh, to the to some server so you could actually uh, perform this attack against uh, such systems as well it wouldn't be easy to to pull it off but it's uh, it's fully possible uh, to do it Now, uh, in summary about timing attacks, uh, we can measure the time uh, different operations take. And depending on the operations and the times they take, we might be able to figure out something about the operands. And uh, this is true in, in many situations. So, so it's something that uh, should be considered. Now the next uh, class of attacks is emission attacks and we will consider a few electronic uh, emissions, so acoustic emissions and uh, voltage. So um, let's have a look. So all electronic systems uh, emit some type of signal just by running. And uh, uh, remember induction. Uh, from uh, physics class and similar properties there as well. Uh, so this this is um, these cause electromagnetic emissions, or they cause uh, acoustic emissions from uh, at different vi vibrations. So if you remember how induction works, uh, you know it causes uh, some minor vibrations depending on power usage and and so on. And, and these can be, be used for, uh, for attacks, as we will see. Uh, so for instance, uh, there was uh, a paper published uh, a few years ago in 2014, where the authors uh, exploited acoustic attacks, uh, so acoustic emissions. Uh, so they showed that they could extract a 4096-bit RSA private key from a laptop uh, PC. And this was uh, GPG, uh, the GPG implementation uh, of RSA. And uh, computers, they do emit uh, high-pitched noise during operations uh, due to the vibrations of, of various components. So for instance, in the power supply unit, where they convert uh, the, uh, the electricity coming in from the power socket to uh, from 230 volts to uh, something that's actually usable by the computer, and uh, this uh, this causes the small vibrations in in some components there, and these vibrations vary. Uh, due to how much uh, power the, the computer consumes. The com computer consumes more power uh, when the, it's doing intense operations, such as when doing cryptography. And this was actually used to uh, uh, derive the key used for decryption uh, of some uh, chosen ciphertext, and the attack worked uh, within an hour. Uh, so that's uh, quite good. And uh, they could actually accomplish these results uh, by placing a mobile phone, they used a microphone of the mobile phone, next to a, a target laptop. And uh, in this case, they, they needed uh, to be able to send ciphertexts uh, to the laptop, and they needed the laptop to decrypt these. So if, uh, but as long as you have a uh, like an email client running on the laptop, and this uh, email client automatically decrypts emails as it receives them, then you can just send email on email on email on email, and then uh, listen to the uh, to these uh, to these sounds. So the, the setup uh, they had uh, was this. So they, they had one setup where they had a, a really good microphone and, and the target laptop here. And in another case, they had a smartphone uh, from which they recorded uh, these sounds. And these sounds are generally too, uh, 
too difficult for, for humans to hear directly, but it's uh, fully possible uh, for, for microphones uh, to pick them up. And uh, this is an example of the, the signals uh, that were picked up. And uh, of course, individual uh, CPU operations are too fast for a microphone to, to pick up because the microphone uh, has a, a sample rate. But uh, long operations such as modular exponentiation, uh, which is the case in, in RSA and uh, El Gamal, as we saw, that can create a very characteristic acoustic uh, spectral signature. And this can be detected since it's so long. You can see here in the picture uh, the, the different uh, operations uh, that they could uh, detect. You see these lines as compared to a lot of other uh, noise. And uh, here we see that uh, the difference between whether a bit is zero or whether a bit is uh, one. So we can, uh, so they attack one bit at a time of the, this key and uh, tries to, to extract it. Uh, so the authors uh, also did uh, another attack, uh, basically the same thing, but in this case they uh, measured the uh, uh, ground electric potential and uh, uh, they could basically connect to the computer's uh, chassis and uh, see the, check the, the voltage. And uh, this varies as the computer performs uh, operations because the power supply unit uh, needs to, to adapt. Uh, and uh, thus you get minor variations. And that allowed them to, to also extract uh, the key. Uh, they could also uh, even uh, measure this at the remote end of a, a network cable. So they didn't even have to be close to the laptop, just have access to, to the network uh, infrastructure uh, to be able to measure this. And they could even uh, use uh, just a hand or uh, a pencil to contact the, to get to contact with the laptop and then they could measure on, on the other end. And uh, here uh, they could actually detect uh, different uh, operations. Uh, so these, uh, the spectrum uh, differs whether it's a floating point multiplication or a normal multiplication or an addition and so on. So they, they can distinguish various operations uh, by the computer. Uh, and yet again, they, they did this attack, but this time uh, electromagnetic emissions. So basically uh, measuring uh, the same signals, but uh, over the air through electromagnetic uh, emissions instead of the, the voltage. So they could detect various operations. And uh, in this case, they could actually fit the recording, the, the sensor, which picks up electronic uh, emissions, they could fit it in a, in a pita bread. Yeah, so an antenna and uh, all the hardware uh, that they needed. And um, finally, there are also other parts emitting electromagnetic signals, uh, for instance, screens. So uh, this, picture here uh, is a picture of a laptop screen uh, reconstructed purely from the electromagnetic uh, em emissions uh, from the screen. And it was uh, reconstructed at uh, 10 meters distance through uh, two intermediate offices. So that's uh, quite good or quite bad uh, from a security point of view that you can uh, read off the screen this well uh, from such a distance. And this result was from uh, 2004 in a, in a paper published back then. 
So in summary, uh, we can measure various things during operations, uh, which depends on, on the physical implementation of things. And uh, these measurements can allow us to infer things about what the system is actually doing and the exact values that it's working on, because uh, it depends uh, very much. So this is something that we really need to consider in uh, depending on the, the situation and the security needed. So uh, there are, of course, uh, a lot of situations where you don't need to consider these things. But on the other hand, there are uh, quite a few uh, which do. So that was everything for this time. Uh, thanks a lot.